Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, in which we take a look at the report Digital Navigators and the Device Divide, Community Voices from Seven U.S. Cities. My name is Carissa Tastian, and I'm Director of Programs at Digitunity, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm joined by Program Officer Nervon West and Brian Barrett, who is Director of Technology. We're also joined by Maribel Martinez, who Digitunity commissioned for this report. If you have questions along the way, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A panel. We'll be using the Q&A panel today. That's at the bottom of your screen. And we'll do our best to answer the questions both in real time, and we're going to have at least a 10-minute question and answer segment at the end of the webinar. If you'd like to share this with colleagues or uh, refer back to key content, we'll be sharing a recording of this webinar via email afterwards. So first, let's see who's here in our group. I know you can't necessarily see who is here and from which organization. So we're going to have a quick poll with two questions. The poll is, what sector do you belong to? And are you a digital navigator? Please take a moment to make your selection. Great. It's great seeing so many um, digital navigators here with us today. Um, thank you for all the important work you do across the country. And it looks like a uh, nonprofit is um, one of the sectors most represented here, but so great to see government, private sector, and some philanthropy as well. Thank you so much. We know this is a large, complex issue, and it's really heartening to see such interest in finding a solution. Thank you. So we'll look at the uh, next slide. Thank you, Nirvan. And talk about our goals for today. Our goals to today are looking at ways of expanding large screen device access through digital navigator programs and emphasizing the importance of connecting the right device to a client's needs. We'll also be looking at the role digital navigators and each of us play in local digital um, device ecosystems. So I welcome you and hope you uh, enjoy today's session. So first, let's take a little look at Digitunity and tell you a little bit about that and why we commissioned Maribel for this important research. We'll take a look at the next slide. Thank you, Nirvan. Digitunity is a national nonprofit focused on advancing digital equity with a particular focus on device ownership. As we all know on this call, owning a computer is the foundation of digital equity. Um, you know how it, it enables education, employment, telehealth, civic engagement, communications, finance, entertainment, so much more. And there's 36 million people in the United States without a computer at home. And that's our area of focus. We've been in this space for almost 40 years, previously known as the National Christina Foundation. Our work over the years has been to source donated technology from individuals and corporations and work with and through a national network of practitioners to get that tech distributed in communities. Employing a community-based sustainable device ecosystem methodology, we're working on supply chain interventions to unlock large quantities of devices to help local communities. We're also working with communities to help foster sustainable digital equity ecosystems. We support a national network of over 1,500 nonprofits, which includes almost 100 nonprofit refurbishers, computer refurbishers. Welcome to you all that are here, our AFTER members. We produce reports and publications to help inform the field, and we're active in state, city, and coalition digital equity planning, advising, and advocacy as well. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce you to Maribel Martinez. Thank you so much, Carissa. Welcome again, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here with you today and with all of the digital inclusion champions who are joining us from so many different cities. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about our latest research study, which will hopefully help experienced as well as new digital inclusion practitioners with their device strategy 
especially within the context of training and supporting digital navigators, but perhaps even more importantly, to help you all think about the need for devices in the towns, counties, and states where you work so hard to close the digital divide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. I represent Maribel Martinez Consulting, a minority woman-owned small business with over 25 years of blended experience in digital equity, nonprofit management, business development, education management, K-12 instruction, professional development and coaching, and technology integration. Please visit maribelmartinezconsulting.com to learn more about our digital equity strategy and education work. Next slide. The overview I will provide today is intended for a broad audience, really anyone who is interested in the digital divide, regardless of their previous experience working on the issue. I encourage everyone to download the full report for Digital Navigators and the Device Divide, Community Voices from Seven U.S. Cities, which is available on ours as well as Digitunity sites after this webinar where I know more experienced digital equity champions will find even more information that will hopefully inform their work. With that, let's dive into the background data that sparked the queries around our study. Next slide. As important as affordable internet is to the inclusion equation, so are devices. Today, about 9 million people in the US do not navigate the internet from their own large screen computing device mainly due to cost. Certain subsets of the population also lag further behind with device adoption, including people of color, older adults, and people with disabilities. Working age adults and students, despite being younger, also struggle with acquiring the right device at an affordable price point, then face frustrations with maximizing the usability of their device due to their fragmented digital skills. Next slide. The pace with which technology evolves influences the phenomenon that the digital divide may in fact be widening. Effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, the demand for devices worldwide, and more and more services moving or originating online create a state of evolve or perish for all of us regardless of age. For households with greater means, obtaining a device, or two, or four, is a matter of pointing and clicking or heading to a store. Thus, while global device supplies have improved since 2020, we find ourselves in a device divide because a growing number of people cannot afford or do not keep up with technology. Next slide. Since price points mainly determine whether computer ownership is possible, it's important to keep in mind that regardless of one's age or ability to pay, every individual can make use of a computer. However, while digital inclusion practitioners understand this, they also face a great challenge helping people to adopt a computing device because of cost as we know but also because we don't see how the internet and computers are relevant to their daily lives, or rather they don't. We also face a great challenge in helping people understand the necessity of a computer and how it coexists with, not supplants, a smartphone. Next slide. As someone who's been working in the digital inclusion space since 2015, I can attest to there being once a very long list of large screen device providers who shipped free or low cost computers to individuals anywhere in the country. Since 2020, that list has become significantly smaller for different reasons. The more I train digital navigators, the greater the evidence of a device divide. Next slide. Our research problem then became very clear. The purpose of this small-scale qualitative research study was to explore the experiences of digital navigators and their computer procurement efforts for asset-limited people, to understand digital navigators' challenges with obtaining affordable large-screen devices, and to gather insights for how to improve the overall process of device procurement. Next slide. Let's define some key terminology from the study so everyone understands how certain terms are used throughout the report. 
Next slide. The participants in the study consisted exclusively of digital navigators with experience in their role ranging from several months to over five years. Digital inclusion practitioners will recognize the specific descriptors for what a digital navigator is trained and is able to do, as you can see here. Next slide. Determining whether something is affordable is absolutely a relative term. For the purposes of this study, a device was deemed affordable if the price point fell between zero and $100 taking into consideration that the Affordable Connectivity Program requires a copay of up to $49 and that a new computer can retail for starting at about $300, we arrived at this definition after an overview of current low-cost device provider price points for tablets and laptops. This affordable price range was also informed by previous experience as a digital navigator, working with affordable device providers and training digital navigators nationally. Next slide. In this study, we're mainly interested in large screen devices, which excludes smartphones. Smartphones are excluded because they are not considered desirable as a device solution, given their small screens and the associated limitations with those screens for tasks such as filling out forms and using productivity tools such as spreadsheets. Next slide. A refurbisher is defined in this study as a company that receives unwanted computers and restores them to like new condition. Refurbishers may give away or resell refurbished computers and they may also require an eligibility process. For example, certain affordable device providers will only give away computers to K-12 students, for example, from Title I schools. Next slide. In this section, I will review the design and context of the study, as well as discuss participant recruitment, composition, locations, as well as the structured interview approach. Next slide. Beginning in September 2022, study participants were recruited via an online form and were also informed they would remain anonymous for this research. All participants were offered a $25 gift card paid by Digitunity in appreciation of their interview time. The questions were developed by the researcher and further reviewed by Digitunity before being finalized. Next slide. The online registration form was available through a link within a project announcement letter that was shared across social media, direct emails, and digital inclusion listservs from across the country. From a pool of 22 self-identified digital navigators who registered for the study, seven participants from across the country were selected, primarily based on their geographic location and their willingness to be recorded on camera for an interview. Next slide. As you can see here on this slide, study participants were scattered across the country representing communities of different sizes and composition from California, Colorado, Illinois, New York, Virginia, Alabama, and Florida, from dense urban cities to small towns. Next slide. The seven digital navigator study participants represented standalone, cross-trained, and part-time digital navigation positions, as well as roles within nonprofits, government, and a public-private partnership. Next slide. Each study participant was asked the same core questions you see here on this slide. The questions relate back to the research problem and it is considered a semi-structured interview because while these four questions were asked of every participant, the approach left room at the discretion of the researcher to ask probing or clarifying questions as each interview flowed. This approach contributed to a richer interview and valuable anecdotes. Next slide. And now for the findings. The percentage of participants who served as a digital navigator at the time of their interview and provided affordable internet, computer, and digital skill support directly to clients. This means that at the time of their interview, each study participant was actively fulfilling the role of a digital navigator. Next slide. 
the percentage of participants who believe it is important to match the right device to a client from the start. This was an interesting percentage and a theme that emerged from the data in tandem with the need for digital literacy training so clients can avoid buyer's remorse as well as persist with their devices. Next slide, please. The percentage of participants who were unable to procure a device for a client through the Affordable Connectivity Program's one-time device discount. For those of us who have been deeply entrenched in digital navigation, this percentage may not be a surprise, considering supply challenges as well as the mandatory co-payment, which remains unaffordable for many households who apply for the ACP. Next slide. The percentage of participants who qualified their experiences with sourcing large screen devices for clients as unsuccessful. One of the most interesting revelations of this study is learning that digital navigators often recommend their clients visit a big box retailer, such as Target or Best Buy, when they're unable to assist them with obtaining a free or affordable computer. Next slide. Another even more interesting finding was learning more about perhaps why or how some digital navigators were successful with procuring devices for clients. As digital navigators were asked to elaborate on their successes, certain words were repeated time and again. Words such as collaboration, partnership, and pipeline. Some digital navigators also specifically mentioned local device pipelines or networks that had been created through intentional partnerships to ensure a steady supply of affordable computers, new and or refurbished, were available to people who needed them. It was evident from the interviews that these quote unquote successful digital navigators also experienced less stress when it came to devices because they knew they could count on an available and affordable device supply. I would venture to add that when a digital navigator is less stressed, they are not only able to help more people, but they may even persist longer as they find continued fulfillment with their role. Next slide. Getting back to some takeaways, the percentage of participants who said clients turn to retail when they're unable to obtain an affordable device through digital navigation support. The correlation between a digital navigator suggesting a client visit a big box store for a computer and clients actually following through with that suggestion, as you can see here, is fairly high. This indicates that digital navigation clients rely on their digital navigator recommendations, possibly because of their trusted relationship and the perception from clients that digital navigators are experts. Next slide. The percentage of participants who made negative comments about refurbished devices or didn't know enough refurbished devices to comment. With nearly half of participants specifically attributing negative feelings to refurbished devices or saying they did not know enough about them to comment, digital navigators may benefit from better understanding computer refurbishers, the computer refurbishment process, how that process can provide quality devices to people who need them, as well as additional training on the availability of local, regional, or national refurbishers they can turn to. This piece is perhaps especially important since refurbished devices have always been part of digital inclusion strategy. Next slide. I was excited to shine a light on digital navigator experiences, but I was also equally interested in their recommendations for how to improve device availability, procurement and adoption, given the visibility of a digital navigator, their knowledge and their individual contexts. At the top of the list, was of course the money. Study participants consistently mentioned additional funding to provide devices to their clients. Some were engaged in learn and earn models, which means computers are given free of charge after the client completes a certain number of computer training hours, for instance, while others offered that students should not be burdened at all with having to purchase a computer in order to successfully compete in the modern classroom, likening today's computer requirement 
to yesteryear's books. But digital navigators also mentioned that funding would be essential to establishing device partnerships, relationships that would make creating sustainable and mutually beneficial collaborations that would ultimately equip everyone with the right device. And that would be ideal, especially if partnerships are local, which was the key. Digital navigators also recommended that we have a clear understanding of digital literacy gaps in order to increase the odds that once a client signs up for low cost internet and obtains a device, that they persist with that device. Along with this comes the suggestion of making computer education available at the purchase point, making it very easy, without cost, and free of stigma for anyone of any age to receive the computer education they need in order to make relevant use of their device long term. Finally, digital navigators also stated that a greater supply of affordable computers be broadly available and accessible, and that it would be almost impossible to close the digital divide without the cooperation of the private sector. I will also add a separate note here that based on my work with philanthropy, that they should also bear responsibility with supporting digital inclusion activities in their communities to help us achieve digital equity. According to recent data, currently less than 1% of philanthropic dollars go towards digital inclusion in the United States. Next slide, please. Before we go to Q&A, I want to publicly thank the seven anonymous study participants. You know who you are, because without you, this research would not have been possible. I also want to thank Digitunity for their commitment to raising awareness about the digital divide, as well as providing leadership nationally to ensure that everyone who needs a device has one. It was a pleasure to conduct this research for you. And with that, I will turn it back over to Carissa. Thank you so much, Maribel. So much great food for thought. And our many digital navigators here, hopefully um, much of this resonated with your experiences. So we have a few questions and the questions uh, I'll pose to you uh, in a moment, Maribel, but I'm heartened by the type of questions that we received. Um, and it really harkens to the idea of what you're saying is that we are focused on devices today, but that some we had questions about internet and making sure that folks are uh, creators and thinkers um, in using the technology so that, you know, the device is a, a tool for um, thriving into today's and giving opportunity to folks. So let me go with the first question here that's really um, looking right at the study, Maribel. Um, they at a an attendee asks, what metrics were used to discuss the capability of the affordable or refurbished devices? And I'm assuming that by metrics, they're looking for some sort of specific definition. So we broadly define refurbishers, as you saw earlier in the slides um, with the terminology. And we did not go into any other metrics or clarification beyond the definition that was agreed upon and provided to the digital navigators. So they knew that, uh, actually all of them knew what a digital, what a refurbisher was. They knew that it was a company who received devices and resold them and typically gifted them. Uh, in other words, you know, gave them away for no charge. Uh, but the hesitation that I mostly saw was in the attestation to being able to rely on that device long term. And so um, it was made very clear uh, from many of the interviews that they just did not rely on, on refurbishers uh, or they didn't know enough about them to be able to comment. And for those digital navigators who said that they did not know enough to comment, uh, it was not a surprise that there were also no local refurbishers that they could partner with or learn from or even visit. And so maybe the idea of refurbisher is very abstract. Uh, it's something that they perhaps hear of in digital inclusion circles and just the broader community, but not something that they have direct um, experience with. So beyond that definition, we did not provide any other clarification. However, every digital navigator knew what a refurbisher was. They knew what a refurbished device was. Um, and, and the ideas about you know, confidence 
and usability afterwards and trust where, where I think where everybody was a little shaky. So if we expand that question to look at the specs of a computer, um, as we know, it's so important, the quality of the uh, device and that it meets the needs of the user and intended purpose. Um, did you have any uh, conversations uh, or any of your questions around specific specs that made uh, that digital navigators were looking for for their clients? Um, did they have conversations about the specifications uh, requirement? We didn't go into very specific specifications. So we didn't talk about processors. We didn't talk about anything beyond a screen size, for instance. We didn't talk about, uh, you know, graphics or video cards or, you know, whether or not, um, you know, we, we want the computer to be able to have, you know, this many hours of battery life. We didn't get that concrete. But what we did talk about was the need for large screen devices. And, and that was something that was consistent across all the conversations. So they knew that we were specifically asking about only desktop computers, laptops, and tablets. I think digital navigators, based on those interviews, uh, I can confidently say that they all agreed that large screen devices are the way to go for clients. Uh, none of them challenged this idea that smartphones would be a solution for someone who doesn't have an electronic device as the only uh, internet or device access point. That's something that we definitely all agreed on. We didn't get into technical specs. However, we can also agree based on the interviews that we had that digital navigators all agree that there should be some sort of keyboard. So whether that's a physical keyboard or maybe uh, a digital one on a tablet, as soon as you change the orientation, for example, uh, or maybe even a, a keyboard that's portable. We also know that some clients prefer mice. And we also know that some clients, for example, older adults will probably gravitate towards a tablet device, whereas students and working age adults lean towards having a laptop. Desktop computers are less and less on the wish list of clients. And it may or may not be a coincidence that they're also harder to come by from refurbishers. Uh, I'm working with a refurbisher in Central Florida now, and they are not even wanting to receive those in terms of donations because they're just not something that people want anymore. And it sounds like for the majority of the digital navigation clients that these digital navigators have been working with, they really want portable solutions. Uh, a lot of the families, of course, want to make sure that their children are connected. And sometimes that computer serves as the family computer. Maybe it's the only computer in the household. So we're looking at something that has a decent size screen, maybe at least 13 inches. Uh, we're looking at obviously a keyboard that comes with a laptop. And then in the case of a laptop or a, a tablet, maybe we can have an attachable keyboard uh, or even a mouse if that's comfortable for the client. I think one of the things that I learned about uh, specifically with these interviews was that digital navigators really do pay attention to their clients' needs and they ask them these probing questions. Uh, a lot of them conduct some sort of intake survey and, and do some sort of case management right from the start so that they're able to say, okay, uh, this is the family composition. Um, I'm almost able to predict what kind of devices are going to be needed now and maybe down the road. And because we have experienced digital navigators, remember, all of these seven digital navigators in the study had at least a few months experience on the job, and the majority actually had at least one or two years experience. So uh, given the digital divide and the demands that we've had over the past few years, they've probably been pretty busy. So I think that they've had ample experience to be able to understand families' needs, but also become familiar with devices um, in that stretch. Now, I'm going to put a pin in that for a quick second and also add that the experience of digital navigators with tech specs is so vital to the success of their relationship and the impact that they eventually have on a client. So I think as I do this work across the country, as I continue to train digital navigators, I know that one of the most important things that I can do is build up that knowledge of technical specs. Are they able to understand what uh, this processor is able to do versus what this computer may not be able to do? Uh, and also relative to the age of the computer, right? So if I have a refurbished computer that's X number of years old, 
Is it going to be able to handle, you know, multiple tabs and Zoom at the same time? Is my child going to be able to game on it? Are we going to be able to have video conferences with our family in another country? So all of these things are really important as we train and support digital navigators. But for those of us who are already out there in the world practicing as digital navigators, I think the information um, about computers and just devices is vital to our practice. Yeah. Well, I'd like to put a plug in for two things that di resources that Digitunity has. Um, you queued us up perfectly for that. Um, thank you to Nirvan West, our colleague, who has put together a de um, demyst demystifying your device, a short lesson on what's in your computer. That's available at Digitunity's website under the resource hub. And then we also have a device essentials graphic um, under our approach on our Digitunity website. And that highlights all the many things um, like you're pointing to um, a headphone or um, camera. We even have refurbishers that give out desks as so essential for the use of the computer. So our device essentials graphic kind of digs into that if you're looking for all of the pieces. It's not just the computer, it's all of the things that make it um, usable. So Maribel, I have a question. Um, we have a question here about digital literacy, and I wondered if I know you have a big background in that, and it's not exactly on devices, but I, if you want to take a, I really appreciate the attendees question because I can hear in the question um, their passion for this topic. They write, in a rapidly evolving digital landscape where access to information and educational resources is increasingly dependent on digital technologies. How can we ethically and effectively deploy digital navigators to not only overcome the barriers of connectivity, infrastructure, and digital literacy in remote and underserved rural communities, but how do we empower individuals to become critical thinkers, creators, contributors to the global knowledge economy, fostering a sustainable and inclusive educational transformation? We could talk about this for days. I know you could. I love this question. And it does tie back to the study, actually, because one of the themes that emerged from the data was this notion that digital navigators are really there as a steward of digital literacy. Uh, they're able to hopefully diagnose and prescribe that digital literacy journey for that particular individual. but going back two steps, that digital navigator has to convince that client that they need a device and that the internet is relevant for them. So one of the things that I work on pretty heavily is helping digital navigators understand how they can help clients understand how the internet is relevant to them and how a device is relevant to them, not just relevant, useful every single day. And this is a huge barrier. So when you talk about wanting people to ethically and responsibly use the internet, but also become creators uh, and, and critical thinkers, all of that is true. But we first have to get them to take that leap into understanding that, A, I need to have this home internet subscription. So please get me one that's affordable because uh, I plan to have it long term because I'm going to need it. And I'm also going to need to get myself a device that makes sense for me. So if I'm a student, I probably need a laptop or maybe a desktop if I want to get fancy. If I'm an older adult, I probably need a tablet. And if I'm a working age adult, I probably need a laptop. And I need to look at those tech specs to understand what device is going to be right for me. Yeah. Now, if that household is limited in terms of income, and so many are, 9 million of them are. So what am I going to be able to afford? And that is where these device partnerships, collaborations, uh, and, and hyper-local partnerships really come into play. Because that question by itself, it's an elephant. It's too big to tackle. But it's totally solvable, I think, hyper-locally everywhere we work. So what a beautiful thing it would be to be able to have uh, our own little ecosystems, right? Where we have digital navigators who are trained, who have 
um, who have the knowledge, but also the experience to be able to help clients with their computers and their internet needs, but also their digital literacy training needs. Remember, it, it's, it's so important for these digital navigators to be able to carry out this process long-term, to go on this journey with that client long-term and just be about, I'm going to get you an ACP application. You're going to get connected and I'm never going to see you again. I really believe that, that these are community navigators and they should be highly visible in the community and we should be investing in their training and in their expertise building so that they can turnkey that to the folks who really need it. Now, we also need the help of nonprofits and community-based organizations and philanthropy and the private sector and government uh, to come along with us on this journey too. Because yes, while you and I and, and so many others on the call have been deeply embedded in this community for years and years, there are plenty of us who are new on this call. And, and so they want to know, how can I get started? Well, I think it starts with local conversations, getting stakeholders involved, and just identifying that goal that we don't want to just create consumers. We want to create uh, producers and creators uh, and just the future generation. We know that, uh, and this is a statistic that I came across uh, not too long ago, and it was just so staggering and surprising, but by 2045, the Black and Latino community is poised to be left out of the majority of jobs if we don't fix the digital divide. So how can we get there uh, if we are you know, leaving specific people out if we are leaving entire swaths of the population out, if they're not being counted. And this is where a digital navigator, because they are the face of that community, they come from that community, hopefully, uh, can really be helpful. But I, I don't want to minimize the question. I don't want to dismiss it, I should say. I think it's just one of those one bite at a time kind of solutions. And it's local. It's a local solution. Thank you. Thank you for that. Maribel, we have a lot of questions coming in. So hopefully we can, uh, we have 20 minutes left together. We'll hopefully be able to Let's get through it. this. All right. So then they're jumping around. I'm doing my best to sort through them for you. But uh, from Sher Sherry, what was there anything that stood out different from one place in the country to another in your research? Yes. So I would say that obviously they're very different um, populations, right, that folks deal with, but the needs are, are basically all the same. So everywhere uh, we, we interviewed with all the digital navigators, they all had students to connect, they all had working age adults to connect, they all had seniors to connect, and uh, the Black and Latino community continued to lag behind if they were represented in that community. So a lot of the things that we talk about in terms of specific people being left out were the same. Um, what sets them apart was that, and, and I think it comes back to the previous question, whether or not there was care and intention in designing a digital equity strategy specifically for that community. And so while we can certainly look at examples from across the country, if I'm you know, somewhere in rural Pennsylvania, let's say, um, I can certainly look at examples of what's happening in other rural areas and take bits and pieces from their successes, but ultimately, we have to sit down locally and figure out how this is going to work here in, in my community, on my block, in my neighborhood. So I think the needs are all the same. Taking it back to devices, because that's why we're here today to talk about the device divide. The need is still there. The need is pressing and it's painful across the country. These digital navigators really struggle with obtaining devices. And so, you know, when they don't have those local partnerships, those local coalitions, those pipelines to really rely on, they, they kind of just throw their hands up in the air and say, go to Target, because they don't know what else to do. And it's frustrating. Who wants to be in a position, uh, is sitting in front of a client, somebody that they desperately want to help, and then have nothing to be able to share with them. And they kind of just do their best um, and I fully understand those responses. I certainly don't blame them for it at all. At the end, we're looking for affordable devices. And if it means that uh, this particular family is going to have to defer, sadly, it happens. But here's a bright spot. And this is a little tangential, but I, I want to say this because I think it's relevant to Sherry's question. 
What I see as I work across the country and also just as I continue to work with these digital navigators in the context of the study, what's interesting is that these families who desperately need devices set the money aside to make it happen. They want these computers. It's not that they're just sitting there waiting for somebody to drop one in their lap. They understand that they want one. They understand that their kids need one in the case of families who have children, school-aged children. And I heard this from a few different digital navigators that they will come back, put something on layaway, set the money aside, and it may take them a while to get it, but they're going to get it. Now, should it be that way? No. So that's what I really want to work on. I really want to work on making devices affordable and available right away. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it talks to, um, you know, building the sustainable device ecosystem. Um, absolutely. I have a really interesting question. I hope I'm interpreting it right, Jim, but the question, and I know you have deep experience, Maribel, not just in the study, but in training and setting up training programs for digital navigators. At what point in the digital navigator, um, you know, connection with their client, um, you know, what number meeting perhaps, does the topic of helping them with the device typically come up? Does that make sense? Day one. Ah. Day one. Day one. Day one. So thinking back on the data, remember that they are administering intake surveys. There's some sort of paper trail that gets initiated right at the first meeting. They may be there to apply for ACP. Let's say it's an enrollment event in the community and they want to get as many people enrolled in the ACP as possible. Fantastic. But there is some sort of paper trail that's happening. And so based on the expertise of digital navigators and however it is that they receive their training and whoever they're working for. So remember, a lot of these digital navigators aren't standalone full-time. Some of them are cross-trained, so they're doing other jobs at the same time, and some of them are part-time, but they're all beholden to an organization. They weren't just out there in the community doing this on their own. They're attached to an org of some sort. So because of that, there was some sort of paper trail that was initiated. Uh, maybe it was an intake survey that was then part of whatever the organization is doing in terms of case management. Maybe it got absorbed into that system. Maybe they created a system on their own to be able to carry all this data. But day one, they are asking about internet, computers, and training. And in my opinion, that's exactly how it should be because we want to look ahead. It's a trajectory. I know Abby with NDIA is on the call, and I know she's been working with work a uh, working group of digital navigators, and I'm sure this might be a topic that came up, but what a great area of sharing best practices in how um, the conversation is structured around um, device needs and so forth. Um, Lazone asks a question, very interesting, as it relates to devices, what about the importance of peripherals like a printer? We talked a little bit about that. He says, as a needed piece of equipment to job search homework, I find many people don't know how to hook one up, get it working mm -hmm. with their computer, let alone, let alone how to scan and save documents. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to share about that? Has it, was that obvious to you in the Digital Navigator interviews? Beyond periphery, I wouldn't even call a keyboard periphery, but beyond headphones, a webcam, and maybe a mouse, none of the other periphery came up. Now, separately, I can tell you that in terms of uh, refurbishers, printers are not something that they really work with. They're mainly working on the computer piece. Um, I can probably agree with you that they may not know how to connect that computer. But then again, they also may not know how to unbox the computer to begin with. And that is something that did come out in the study. And it, it was all about the education piece. And you saw in one of those slides, one of the things that the digital navigators advocated for was this need for making sure that people knew what they needed to know when they needed to know it. And in some cases, it was at the purchase point. So when I'm ready to buy my device, uh, I want to be able to be offered computer education. This was one of the recommendations that they made. I want to be able to be offered, you know, the ability to set up my computer, to unbox it without fear of stigma or shame or cost. 
uh, because again, you know, it shouldn't be about that. It should be about moving forward with the ability to use a, a device in, in the best way possible and for the longest time possible. So I, I, I would agree with that. I, doing this long enough, I know that, we, listen, we all have fragmented digital skills. I will not absolutely sit here uh, on, a, on a pillar and, you know, distinguish myself. Absolutely not. Uh, and, and we all need to come at it, I think, from that perspective, from a learning perspective. And that's the only way that I think we can we can be sensitive and help each other. Um, someone asks, um, how, what a guidance or advice would you give um, digital navigators in convincing community members that the Internet and devices are relevant to them? That's been a question in digital equity field for a long time. What are, what are your thoughts, Mirabelle? Keep beating that drum. Keep beating that drum. How long have we been doing this, Carissa? Yeah. Keep beating the drum. Somebody is bound to say yes. I think that I've worked with enough public-private partnerships and have worked within enough coalitions and, and, and large digital equity planning organizations and entities uh, to, to understand that it, it really is just a matter of time. Uh, luckily, we are in a better time than we used to be. Uh, a lot more people care about digital inclusion, and it's a conversation that's happening around the country. I can certainly introduce myself and talk about my company and say that we work on digital equity strategy and education, and people nod their heads and go, oh, yeah, that's really important. Whereas before, they probably would have asked me to define what digital equity was. So I think the best advice that I can give you is get to know the players in your area, do that asset mapping, understand where your stakeholders are, who they are, uh, not only in terms of and beneficiaries, but also um, for anyone from public figures all the way down to your community-based organizations. Someone cares about this with you and someone will go on this journey with you. It, it starts with two people and an idea. And from there, it's bound to grow. So I think persistence is key. And I think once you once you decide that you want to go on that journey and you work at it hard enough, eventually it will pay off. It doesn't hurt to have the ear of local politicians and elected officials, for example. That definitely greases some wheels. I would also uh, recommend that you approach your community-based organizations, your community foundations, uh, and, and anyone who may be willing to go on this journey with you. But it starts with those conversations. Find like-minded people. And for the individual who may not be convinced, uh, one of your digital na navigator clients, um, I can imagine relationship building, which is the beauty of a digital navigator model, really um, can help people understand the benefits of doing so. Um, if Maribel, you evangelize long enough, oh, I'm sorry, Carissa, I just want to add one more quick point. So if you evangelize long enough, uh, you'll convince them. I For years, I think that especially the older population was relatively ignored, right, when it came to digital inclusion. And we know now that it is probably essential to life at this point for older adults to be connected to technology. And listen, we got there because of persistence. And we also got there because we became better skilled at understanding how to communicate relevancy to populations that didn't quite adopt then. We'll get there. Sounds very hopeful. And I know so many people on this call are working towards that, even overcoming fear and um, a fear of safety, fear of confidence, all of those things play a role, of course. I uh, would be amiss if I didn't put, uh, let folks know, and there's some questions coming in around this. If you're looking for a um, nonprofit technology refurbisher in your area, if there was one available, you can find a map at uh, the Digitunity website um, under the Alliance for Technology Refurbishing and Reuse. So uh, be sure to check that out. Okay, this is a kind of a interesting question from Susan. Thank you, Susan, for this question. Maribel, why do you think that philanthropic organizations have not provided more support? That is a question. Why do I think? I don't know that I have the answer, but I can tell you that I know that philanthropic organizations are very mission focused. They have very specific programs or projects in mind, and they will fund those projects because that's what they set out to do. And I think that prior to 2020, 
most of those organizations probably didn't think that digital equity or digital inclusion was part of what they needed to be concerned about. Uh, those of us who have been here long enough uh, remember knocking on those doors and you know having those doors closed because I'm just not in the business of connecting people to the internet. It's just not what I do. Uh, but I think we know now that it is foundational. It is entry level. It's, it's access to everything that we do every single day. And so when it comes to philanthropy, I think that the tide is changing. I also think that with enough of us out there trying to make the case for relevancy, that this could happen and that them coming along with us in terms of you know, being a, a funding partner, let's say, that that might be something that becomes more of a reality. It is also um, quite a burden, right, for any organization to be constantly approached for money, uh, especially when it's uh, a request that maybe is repetitive. And so I think we have to get creative about what we ask for and, and what we intend to use those funds for. I knew that, you know, when I started working in digital inclusion, asking people for money for computers was hard. If you told them it was for kids, you might get lucky. But if you told them you wanted tablets for seniors, maybe not so much. That's changing. But because I think that we're all living in a much different world than, than we were just even a few years ago, that philanthropy, because of community stakeholders and those elevated, louder voices for digital inclusion, that they, they, will, they will come along and they will understand that, that they do play an essential role. Thank you. Just a few more questions and we'll move yeah. on. Um, and if we haven't been able to answer your question, um, I believe we'll be able to keep a transcript and follow up with you with your some answers. But uh, I do want to make a comment, and this is something I experienced, we have experienced at Digitunity as well, about desktop computers. Uh, Christine, who is very uh, involved in refurbishing um, in New York, says that we've experienced that a desktop computer is more stable remaining in the home for a family unit versus portable that may be moved out of the home, perhaps dropped or stolen. So the opportunity to keep the desktop in the home for students and home use. So there is a, a you know, a place for uh, desktop computers, absolutely. Sometimes it takes just a little education about the benefits of doing so. I can't so, disagree with that. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. Uh, Wanda wants to know how techie, and we're kind of got around this, but share a little more. How techie does a digital navigator need to be? Oh, I get that. I honestly, I get that question all the time. Um, it's not about how techie they need to be. It's how adaptive they can be. So I think that once digital navigator gets trained and they're out there in the community, like I said earlier, we all have fragmented digital skills. But it's that willingness to grow in our knowledge and in our practice that it's going to set a good digital navigator apart from an excellent digital navigator. And so I think it's that willingness to learn and to grow. And isn't that what we all need to do anyway with our own digital skills, right? Uh, technology is moving so fast. There is not one person on the planet that those, knows everything that there is to know about computers and the Internet. It's just impossible. So we really just need to do our best to keep up and to help one another. Uh, so for our last question, and apologies again, we couldn't get to all of them, but we will um, do our best to follow up how we can. Um, and maybe it'll be uh, you're really so much to appreciate your question and interaction here. Um, it can be the formation of future webinars as well. Matthew asks, since tech support is one of the recommendations by the new digital equity model, how did the digital navigators overcome some of the issues that are beyond the basics? And I think I'd extend that in a couple of ways. Um, when, what was the limit for the digital navigators in helping someone? And then what did they do um, for if someone needed additional techno technical support for their device? So some of the examples that the digital navigators provided in terms of the, the, the typical digital skill support uh, that they, they typically you know, engaged with them was uh, things, something as simple as setting up an email account, uh, maybe connecting to Wi-Fi, helping them browse, helping them complete, let's say, a SNAP application. Uh, so really day-to-day -day kind of stuff, building a resume. And, and then more advanced topics would probably be things like productivity tools in the cloud. So Google Drive, uh, 
uh, things of that nature, Zoom calls, Google Meet, all those good things. I didn't hear that digital navigators were engaged in real micro super techie stuff. So I didn't hear any digital navigator that was asked, can you teach me how to code? Uh, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It just didn't come up in the study. And maybe that's a good uh, area to think about for future research. But in terms of you know how techie, no. Uh, I, I, like I said, I think going back to the other question that it's 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 a growing it's a growing point. You know, it's it's something that we need to just commit to. I can imagine folks coming in with viruses, um, having worked at the library for a long time. Those were the, some of the questions that came in, and so. Um, you know, it is also from where your device sources come from. Make sure many of the refurbishers have technical support. States are standing up technical support hotlines, um, warranties. Those are also important considerations um, when making the device purchase. So, and a lot oh. of the a lot of the the digital navigators end up supporting with smartphones. Believe it or not, even though we don't advocate for them as devices, because that's what the client has. Of course, we want to get them across the line to a device. But no, not nothing heavy duty. Um, yeah. Yeah, digital navigators wear many hats. <laughs> we certainly many. appreciate them. Mm -hmm. So um, moving on through the webinar uh, slide, uh, if we can advance to the next one, we're planning a webinar um, sometime in the early fall. Um, and it's going to be focused on how where to get devices, some sources for them, and a deeper uh, no, no, we don't want a deeper divide. We have deeper dive into a sustainable device ecosystem. So look for, um, you're all on our mailing list now. We appreciate that. And we'll get word out in um, early fall about that. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to present and or if you'd like to present in a webinar, please reach out to me. That would be wonderful. Uh, Maribel, on our next slide, there's some information about you. Would you like to share anything specific here? I just want to invite everyone on the call to visit Digitunities or our website, maribelmartinez.com, where you'll be able to find a copy of the full report as well as a separate summary available after today's webinar. We also want you to use the hashtag device divide to talk about today's learnings. If there's anything you'd love to share, we'd love to hop on the conversation with you. Uh, my contact details are there. Uh, if you are handy with a QR code, that will probably get you there faster. But thank you again for all of your wonderful questions and for the opportunity to share today's findings. And I'd like to thank you, Maribel, for um, being a wonderful research partner and thought partner in this work. And um, I'd like to thank our technical team, Brian and Nirvan, and of course, the whole Digitunity team as well. So. Um, Thank you so much. On our next slide is my email address, carissa at digitunity.org, if you uh, would like to reach out. And we look forward to um, pleased to be part of the community with you. And thanks for spending your time with us today. Thank you so much.